In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Indeed, a great light came among them in the very person of Jesus, going about all the towns of Galilee, and well, later on he comes into Judea, healing, preaching, teaching God's word, and spreading good news of the kingdom, casting out demons, curing every disease that they bring to him until well, there's just crowds and lines lined up, swarms of people following him everywhere, just trying to get a taste, to get a glimpse, to get a touch. Jesus comes and he brings with him the kingdom of God in flesh. He comes with him a foretaste of the heavenly paradise that is coming into the world through his own death and resurrection. He comes already among them with peace and salvation and deliverance. And John is in prison. John is not out there with the crowds. John is not there in line getting healings and hearing the good news. John is stuck in the dark, in a prison, locked away. Herod locked him up. King Herod did not like what John had to say. Well, he didn't like what he had to say about his marriage. John spoke God's law, and Herod didn't like to hear that he wasn't allowed to take his brother's wife to be his own. So, what is a king to do? Obviously, you throw him in prison. I don't want to hear you anymore. I'm just going to lock you up, as if that's going to make the problem go away. Already it sort of admits his guilt, doesn't it? He knows exactly what he's done wrong. Otherwise, he wouldn't have locked him up. And in fact, John is there in prison awaiting, though he may not know it yet, soon to be killed for his testimony, beheaded for his witness to the truth. So there John is in the prison, in the dark and dusty jail. Jesus is outside, walking about, spreading light and life among sinful men. And the most surprising thing of it all is not simply that John, this faithful witness, this forerunner, this prophet, is locked away. Well, that's not surprising at all. That's how it's been with all of God's prophets from the beginning. The surprising thing is that John in prison still has disciples. What are they doing there? He's locked away in prison. Maybe they're bringing him food, supplying him with something, tending to his needs. I don't know. But for some reason, they're so devoted that they're actually there visiting him in prison instead of out there where the kingdom of God is being poured out hand and foot. And we hear elsewhere in the Gospels that, well, first of all, John points out to his followers that here he is, the Lamb of God. He's the one we've been waiting for. He said it in no uncertain terms, and yet... Well, John still has some disciples. They don't immediately all jump ship and go follow Jesus, the way you might think, the way Andrew and Peter did. John still has disciples, and we're told elsewhere in the Gospels that they're not too crazy about this Jesus going around healing and preaching and baptizing. They've got some concerns. They come back to John and they say, John, this Jesus, this one who was with us and went out from us, now he's out there baptizing, making a name for himself. Well, at the time, John's reply was, yeah, that was the point. I must decrease, he must increase. And yet, here's John in prison, and he still has disciples. Disciples to send, disciples to point out that they need to go find Christ. It couldn't have been easy, of course, being one of John's disciples. This wasn't a comfortable experience. John did his preaching and teaching, not in palaces and comfy halls, not even in the temple. He was in the wilderness. Out in the heat, out in the desert, out where there was nothing to eat, nothing to drink. John the Baptist was out there eating honey and locusts, wearing nothing but some camel's furs. It wasn't an easy following to follow John and be his disciple, nor was it easy to hark to his preaching. John preached the law. He did it to Herod. He did it to his own disciples. He did it to those who came to be baptized. Leave off your sins. Repent. That was the call. The kingdom of God is coming near. It's coming soon. It will be here before you know it. So John, well, he had the duty to prepare the disciples, to prepare them that they might receive Christ. 
as those who are in need of forgiveness, not as those who think they are already righteous already. It had to be hard to be John's disciples, to hear the law and still be sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting to find some fulfillment. Yes, he spoke of the one who was to come, but he was afar off until finally he drew near. Meanwhile, there's Jesus. He speaks something totally different. He's out there pouring out healing and mercy and forgiveness. We're not told that he demands anything from those who come to him. In fact, he seems almost too liberal with it, don't you think? Shouldn't he ask some more questions first? Shouldn't he get a background check first? Who is he giving all these gifts and healings and blessings to? Well, he demands nothing of them except one thing, one question. Do you believe that I am able to do this for you? And so we get the phrase over and over in Jesus' healings. Let it be done for you as you believe. They come to him, and by that very act, they confess that he has what they need, that he can supply what they desperately lack, that they set their trust in him to provide it. Let it be done for you as you believe. And so they receive according to their faith. They haven't proven themselves. They haven't proven themselves to be worthy in any sense, for of course they aren't. They can't be. That's the whole point. That's why they're there. Several of them, in fact, confess that very thing, as we know from the Gospels. They're sinners. Poor, miserable sinners. They haven't fulfilled the law. They haven't fasted and prayed with John out in the wilderness until they were starving and hungry. No, Jesus was the one who fasted for them. Here, poor, miserable sinners come and receive freely life and salvation, forgiveness, and a kingdom. There's this dreadful gap here between the two. On the one hand, you have the voice of the law crying out repentance, crying out that you must prepare yourself, crying out that you are not ready, you're not worthy. Then you look over the other side and you see Jesus demanding nothing giving freely, bestowing on all who come to him whatever they need. And yet God sees fit to send both. For they both serve their purpose. This is a gap that John's disciples just couldn't seem to cross, apparently. They're offended, it says. Yes, Jesus is curing the blind, making the lame to walk, cleansing lepers, raising the dead. Blessed are those who are not offended by me in all of this. They are offended. And not just offended the way we throw that word around. Oh, I don't like what he said. I don't like what he did. And now I'm just going to take it as an excuse to be cruel to him and not forgive him or whatever it might be. It's the way we throw around offense. No, this has to do with a stumbling block. Something that causes one to fall, to fail, to fall short. They're on the way. They're on the path. They're walking the road that John is leading them on. And then they trip. Something has been laid in their way. The scriptures teach us not to lay a stumbling block before others in matters that uh, should be free to them. We don't tell people you have to eat this way. You have to wear this thing. That's how you're saved. What a stumbling block that would be. But there's one stumbling block that is unavoidable. It's there whether you like it or not. It's Jesus. And so we find that he indeed is the stone that the builders rejected. And those who stumble over this stone, over Christ, he says, will be crushed. Those who meet their salvation and the fulfillment of the law in Jesus Christ and don't like what they see will be crushed. They will stumble. They will fall. John cannot save a single one of his disciples unless they leave him and go to Christ. John and the voice of the law cannot accomplish any of it. That's the whole point. He is not enough. He's there to point towards something greater, to point towards the real fulfillment. So he sends the disciples, go and ask them, are you the one or not? Well, what do you see? The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. All of these impediments, all of these ailments, the very fruit of sin and death and destruction in the world are undone at a touch, 
at a word. Something greater than John is here, if you couldn't tell. Now here is the kingdom itself in the flesh, undoing what man has done with his sin, indeed undoing even death itself, raising up those who have died. And he crowns the list of all of these great miracles with the greatest of all, the poor have good news preached to them. The proclamation of the good news. Look on it with your outward eyes. It doesn't seem like it fits with healings and miracles and raising the dead. But dear saints, that is the best one of all. Lazarus, the widow's son, the daughter of Jairus, they were raised, and yet at some point, they died. They didn't live forever. They didn't ascend bodily into heaven. No one has written that. They received a gift of temporal life, bodily life again. Thanks be to God. The lepers were cleansed and then lived in this life. We pray in repentance and faith and then received life to come in Jesus Christ. The good news that is preached to those who are spiritually poor, those who are lacking, those who are desperately in need of salvation, that's the miracle. That's the crowning achievement. That is what Christ has come to bring. And so then, indeed, here he is, the one who is to come. He answers with his own deeds, fulfilling the prophecies of old, fulfilling even what Isaiah spoke of. Now he sends them back, or rather we should say they go back to John to report what they see. In the meantime, Jesus turns to speak to his own crowd, his own disciples. And now, well, we might think that they have a different perspective on John. After all, they're the ones who left. Even in Jesus' own words, he assumes they were there, along with everyone else, to see John and hear his preaching. Why did you go out there to see him? What did you go out to see? They're the ones who heard John's preaching and went and followed Christ. So they might be thinking to themselves, here is John in prison. Here is John who has amounted to nothing. Here is John who, well, yes, he led us here, but we're done with him now. We've got Jesus. But Jesus has something to say about John. He identifies him for who he truly, truly is. He's certainly not a reed shaken by the wind. That is, he's not just out there telling everyone what they want to hear. By no means, when you hear John's preaching. That's why he's in jail. He's certainly not a man wearing soft, or we might translate it, effeminate. A man wearing effeminate clothing. Living in luxury somewhere in a palace. Serving only for pleasure and telling others how they can do the same. How they can be rich and wealthy and prosperous. Obviously, that's not what John's there to do. He is a prophet, a prophet after the mold of the prophets of old, who indeed bore hardship, knew no pleasure in this life, were hated, were wronged, were imprisoned, were killed, and yet all the while they pointed to something else. They called out the people of their own age to come out of their sins, to leave it, and instead to go somewhere else and to look ahead to the salvation that is to come. Indeed, he is a prophet, more than a prophet, even the forerunner, the one who is sent to prepare their hearts for the coming of the kingdom in Jesus Christ. So you see the whole dynamic here. John is the voice of the law, who indeed calls them to repentance, and yet speaks of a hope that is to come, looks forward and sees the fulfillment from afar. There it is, in prison, looking out and hearing of the deeds of the Christ, as if from a distance, finally, finally coming to fulfill everything he spoke. And then there is the gospel that comes to fulfill it in Jesus Christ. The gospel which comes demanding nothing that the law demanded. Instead, freely gives and forgives and saves. Blessed are all who are not offended by him. In fact, the world is offended by the gospel, and not just by the gospel, but the law as well. It's certainly offended by both. Herod did not like to hear what the law had to say, and so he locked it away. No different than it's been since the beginning of the world. Indeed, it's all around us. The world hates the church, especially when the church has something to say about the law. Especially when the church has something to tell the world about how it wants to live. No. 
you can't marry whoever you want. No, you can't do whatever you want with your body. No, you cannot treat people however you want. And no, you cannot serve yourself however you please. No, you can't. It's wrong. Stop. That's not what the world wants to hear. And so the world has no, no need for us. The world has no need for the church in its own eyes. And if it could, if it has the power, and indeed in many places in the world it still does, it will lock that voice away. Dear saints, this isn't just to complain about the world around you, but it's in you as well. We don't want to hear it. We especially don't like to hear the law when it has something to say to us. Oh, yeah, we agree, that's wrong, sure, in general, but uh, when you tell me exactly what I should not have done, I don't want to hear that. No, thank you. We are people of our own generation. and We've been taught by our world and our culture to serve ourselves, to live for ourselves, to please ourselves. That's not what God teaches. So, we turn to the gospel. But you know what? The world doesn't like the gospel much either. First of all, if you go out and tell people that their sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ, then, well, that just lets them know that they had sins that needed forgiven. And we're back again to the law. They don't want to hear it. They want to know that they're self-sufficient, that they have everything they need. But that's not even the real problem. We hate how universal the gospel is. Oh, yeah. Forgiveness for me, but... You can think of five people right now that you don't think should ever receive it. You can think of people all this world over that you don't want to receive forgiveness. You want them to receive justice. We like justice. We like forgiveness for us. It's a little bit different when it's for others. We're a little bit like Jonah, who didn't want the gospel preached to Nineveh. We're a little bit like James and John, who saw some people mistreating their Lord and wanted fire to rain down from heaven on them. Or you know what? Sometimes we don't like the gospel simply because we don't believe it's for us. Simply because we have a hard time believing that what Jesus has said could actually be for my stony, sinful heart. Each one of us has our own sinful tendency. Whether we love the rigor of the law and are drawn to it, drawn to getting all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted. Whether we just like the justice of it. Or whether we're too afraid to actually believe that Jesus could be for us. Part of us wants to remain in that prison with John. We would like it. But then there's that part of us that wants that libertine freedom that would just reject John altogether as if nothing he said ever mattered. I get to go to Jesus now and that means I get to do whatever I want. As if there was some way to get to him without going through the preaching of John and the law. And so, dear saints, the answer to it all, as it always was, was what Jesus commanded his disciples to preach. Go into all the world and proclaim to the whole creation repentance and the forgiveness of sins. So we're here, a week out from Christmas, a week out from the coming of our Lord in the flesh and our celebration of it. How then are you preparing? Repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Hear the voice of John calling you to make straight the paths. Take time, take the effort, take the moment to do it, and set forth what you can of your own ways and set them straight. Listen to the voice of the law. And then tell it to be quiet and go talk to Jesus. Because Jesus has something else for you. Jesus has forgiveness of sins that doesn't demand anything from you. It doesn't demand any worthiness. It doesn't demand any hoops to jump through to get it first. And once you've passed through the words of the law and you know how badly you need it, it's there. Freely poured out for you. Freely spoken. Freely given at this very altar. This gap that we never quite cross between the law and the gospel. The repentance and the forgiveness. We keep cycling back and forth. We need to live in both and yet we can't quite keep it straight. It's the gap that Jesus crossed on the cross itself. There is all of your sin nailed to the tree. There is the law that tells you what it deserves, the death that should have been yours, but it's not yours. It's his. And there is the very voice of the gospel. The law fulfilled, sin paid, death undone, the free forgiveness poured down on you, healing and even eternal life. Dear saints, this is why we rejoice. 
So prepare your heart. Look forward to the joy that is to come and the forgiveness that is poured out for you freely. He has done it for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.